Welcome to a special episode of Fire Breathing Kittens. This is our rules discussion where we discuss the rules we played in the past half a dozen games or so for January 2024. Today I am joined by the people who play. <laughs> oh. Don't remember the name. Zidane! Hi. Hi, yes, it's me. I am here and present <laughs> for this. <laughs> Sadie. Hey. Oh, I mean, <clears throat> hi. No, I don't know if that's, if that's correct. <laughs> and Ball follow me. Well, it's nice to meet everyone here. Um, I'm looking forward to this next episode. This is going to be a lot of fun talking about the rules. All right, so let's dive in reading these reviews written by our Fire Breathing Kittens players and GMs. So we're going to start with the episode Hello Citizens, which featured the RPG system Resolute to second edition uh the first review is it was way too roll heavy for podcasting combat is clunky and really bogs down the pace i think for a home game with friends who really have time to learn the rules and aren't on a time crunch it could be a lot of fun yeah in resolute second edition you build your character by spending points on superhero abilities from a list rather than having a set armor class number rolling to hit, and rolling damage are both countered by their own defensive rolls by the target. You deal either 1, 2, or 3 damage based on if you were approximately 10, 20, or 30 over the target's defensive roll number. The range window isn't always 10 and needs to be manually calculated for each opponent, so that takes time. Combat is done in two steps. First, everyone declares their intended action from the slowest to the fastest person, then, from the fastest to the slowest person, you take action. I guess the reason for designing the combat this way is to let fast superheroes like the Flash and Quicksilver respond to the declared actions of slower superheroes and move out of the way before the slower superheroes can hit them. These mechanics definitely do succeed at portraying the difference in response speed, but ironically, I, the player, felt less like my character was superpowered in Resolute 2E than in other systems with faster combat rounds. So there I was playing a really speedy character, and I was waiting. <laughs> so perhaps <laughs> if the enemies had set evasion and defense numbers, rather than rolling twice to generate their ev evasion from being hit and defense from damage every time, that could shorten the delay and increase excitement when players attack to have like a non-symmetric battle design. The players can still have that system, sure, but the NPCs to make it just go faster would have your standard... Like, you don't have to roll for it. You just know if you hit them or not. So just a thought. Mm -hmm. um, the rules are solid, but the combat mechanics are clunky. Too much rolling to determine the outcome, and it's all for between one and two damage. This game is one you can enjoy, but I'd recommend a GM who is lax with the rules, and I'd encourage everyone involved to read the rules thoroughly. And I remember playing in that game, and it was very rules-heavy, it wasn't incredibly rules heavy, but going into it with just a general idea of the rules wasn't a good idea and it's causing some confusion. So, yes, if you're going to play this game, there isn't a lot of rules, but just make sure you read through them beforehand. It'll make it a lot easier. Yeah, it was only like 10 pages and like seven of them were lists of abilities you could mm -hmm. take. I think it's just the concept, you know. Mm -hmm. Is it all superhero based? Theoretically, but I was a centaur who threw potions. Yeah, well, I guess threw it, horrifying it, it, potions. <laughs> <laughs> was it built specifically for superheroes? Yes. Okay, so they had that in mind when creating it. But yeah, I think you, you're right in that. If uh, you're playing a quick character and you don't feel speedy, then you're not playing it thematically. You're just sort of being held down by the mechanics, which just isn't intuitive. So... There's a scene in an X-Men movie where I think it's Quicksilver. It's the mutant with the silver hair who runs really fast. He like runs and like time slows down and he can like catch people before this explosion. And the scene is all about him like casually like munching on a donut and moving a person out of the way and like coming back. And like still the explosion has only moved like a millimeter closer to them. And he moves like 30 people out of the room before they can react. I think that's what they were going for where you're not fast in your turn, you're faster than everyone else in the room, you know, mm -hmm. so you can see why they did it, mm. why they th planned it. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It reminds me of another game coming up. Ooh. 
<laughs> oh yes, of course. Uh, well, that's slow like motion. That's a tease. The game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is a tease. Yeah, the slowest, painfully on. slow game I've ever <laughs> no. experienced in my we'll, human we'll come life. To that. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll get, get there. there. When, uh, <laughs> dear Lord. Um, um, but just one last thing about the Resolute Second Edition. I did really like the superhero theme and theme and skills list. Um, if you want to build any X Men with that list, you totally can. And if you're looking to role play as X Men, you you very mm-hmm. much can with that system. But mm-hmm. for me, the fastest combat and the most like immersive combat I've ever been in is Lasers and Feelings, a single roll, a single outcome, bam. Like, but that it's aiming for something else, which is the snowballing of player emotions into these weird behaviors. Like, uh, <laughs> if you guys have listened to <laughs> so, then I started blasting. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So then I, I started blasting. It just like went, to, yeah. It just like went to <laughs> violence real fast. Like, mm-hmm. But um, rather than like emotional snowballing and like a violence tornado, this one was going for. I am the fastest X Men in the room, so that's why I did that. Okay, all right. We can go on to the next game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the episode "The Root of War" featured the RPG system Root, the free quick start. The Root R. Uh, Quick Start TTRPG is probably the best Power by the Apocalypse system I've played so far. The mechanics are relatively easy to pick up, and you get a better sense of the mechanics the longer you play the game. Unlike other Power by the Apocalypse games, the Root TTRPG adds more rules and mechanics to their move mechanics, and also has a variety of rules in around travel, NPC interactions, health and item use, factions, and character creation. All of the sp- the specifics provide a solid foundation for PC actions and helps with the balancing encounters and adding consequences to player actions. I'd love to run a full campaign in the system to see how the mechanics hold up over time. Really firm mechanics for a PBTA style system. It really has some neat class abilities and faction rules. Allows some fun role playing opportunities while not being too punishing when characters fail roles. Some of the PBTA style games we've played have poorly defined mechanics and sometimes even broken abilities. But from what I can tell, this system was well thought out and designed. Yeah, I'll give it that. I didn't find that one move that I did every time. (laughs) <laughs> that's what i usually do with part by the apocalypse systems the i'm like this move. one does three times as much damage yeah, yeah. i'm doing this one over and over <laughs> so now this is such a massive bugbear for me and i'm probably going to get hate for this but i hate when a system can't sorry a game just can't make their own mechanics and it's like well we've got this ip and it's a really popular board game that a lot of people love uh let's just throw power by the apocalypse behind it because no one can be bothered to make a new game let's just throw that on because it's quick and we can just edit it and then be done in six months um it uh, really frustrates me it's that's not what they did though this was PTA actually so games. that would be that would suck yes but this one i played so i was a player mm-hmm. um it was the only powered by the apocalypse game i've ever played that i was a engineer in it and in order to do my mechanics i had to make a thing and I was like, oh, it's encouraging me to make stuff. And I'm an engineer and I've got to make stuff if I want to do my mechanics. And I got to make more stuff and then I can use the stuff I made. And then, ah, oh, look at that. So I didn't do any other classes, but the one class I did, I was impressed by the encouragement of role playing by the mechanics. Has anyone played the board game? Well, I said the board game, the mini war game. I haven't. Root. I mm. haven't played the board game, um, but I, and I actually haven't played Root. RPG the root RPG um, but I played a lot of PBTA and uh, I will say that since root is published by magpie I'm not at all surprised that they use PBTA Uh, magpie does really well with PBTA games and they do some pretty good designs like they design the avatar legends RPG as well and they put thought into how to how to bring out that IP in that framework in that pbta framework so for Mm -hmm. me like i agree with you a lot of times a company takes an ip and they put out a subpar game they put out a a a game that's not well designed for the feeling of the art of the ip but i don't i don't feel like that's something that mag i I feel like magpie does a pretty good job of not doing that of avoiding that um i have my own criticisms of magpie as a general like you know some of their design decisions that i disagree with but 
but in general i i like when they design a pbta game um i i generally like what they do i think it's just it turns into some sort of cash cow it's kind of like well we've got this massive ip how can we just get this out as quick as possible do you know what i mean like can we just can we tweak this rule set that already exists and get it out in six months and try and make a good man chunk of money like avatar was what, what like three million on a kickstarter it's not an original system but it's because the ip is so um massive you know you know it turns into just an ip game but the root quick start was free so um mm. we didn't pay anything to play this game it was a free quick start and they let us download it from their website everything's there the playbook and the like all the moves and everything and and a bunch of different like I don't know the words for Powered by the Apocalypse. Classes? I want to say classes because I'm They're called playbooks. <laughs> They're playbooks. Okay. They're usually yeah. called playbooks. Yeah. Yeah, all the playbooks are free. So it didn't seem... I don't like Powered by the Apocalypse games in general. And I didn't find my major problems with this one. They didn't exist here. There wasn't just yeah. one overpowering move. And it, it did encourage mm. role play. It mm. made me build mm. stuff. I think I spent three turns building a water collection device, an inverted concave glass for <laughs> condensing underground humidity. Yeah. Mm. Did it have any war war elements in it? Like, who I don't know who ran it, but, it, you know, when reading through it, I wonder if they've kept that theme from the board game, having it about a war between four <laughs> factions, essentially, and you are in the middle of it. Yes. <laughs> yes, we had squirrels versus possums. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. It was literally a war versus possums and squirrels. We were on the possum side, so we decided so was, to mess those squirrels yeah, up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there was the war in that. Yeah. Baked into it. Okay, that's cool. I'm glad they, they kept with that. Yeah, it was pretty good. You can listen to it. Mm. It's free. All right. <laughs> Next game. <laughs> mm-hmm. The episode All I Want for a Nick and Mismas is You featured the RPG system Christmas Capers. Christmas Capers is the perfect game for the holidays. Character creation is easy to do, and the base mechanics work well, as well as unique mechanics like the random improv events picture table, though some mechanics seem very unnecessary, like using your quirk to make challenge a challenge more difficult in order to try restoring HP or karma. I'd recommend this game to any GM who wants to run a game for children in order to celebrate Christmas and introduce them to TTRPGs. It'd also be a fun game to play between friends over some drinks at a Christmas party. However you celebrate the holidays, this game will make a great addition. Christmas Capers has the potential of being a fun system, but I think it's hard to apply it to anything other than its prescribed Christmas setting. I wish we had good reason to use the mechanics to problem solve throughout our adventure, but we mainly role played through the obstacles and didn't use the mechanics much. I'd like to play the system again in the style it was intended and see how I like it, but I probably wouldn't if, sorry, I probably wouldn't use it for a Fire Breathing Kittens game in the future. Yeah. Um... Christmas. Who made this? <laughs> Who made this game? Um, a person who sent us the game made it. Um, I don't want. I don't know if they want me to reveal their name. So I'm sure they would. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Please find, tell me. You can find Christmas Please. Capers uh, with a quick Google search. But so I will say my feedback now. Um, so I listened to the episode and I read the rules. And I will say, I like that it specifically eliminates death in a Christmas themed game. <laughs> you don't <laughs> die, and you can't possibly die. You can just be eliminated from the scene, and that mm -hmm. makes sense because. You can get knocked out in a bar fight, right? But mm -hmm. nobody's dying on Christmas. So I like that. That's nice. The way the explanation is, you don't die, but you just come back because Santa's magic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's also um, you dress up as one of the like Christmas. Uh, there's not really a good word in English for it. Like mascots, like a reindeer or a snowman or a Krampus. You know, so you're like you're playing the game in costume. Yeah, it's just cute. I like it. It's one page. It seems great for kids. I think they had a great time. And I will say that was our only possibly ever romantic comedy episode of Fire Breathing Kittens. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised. <laughs> I'm surprised I was a GM for surprised. that episode. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, like it really encouraged this like spirit of like togetherness and bonding. And like I feel like a couple got made over the course of that episode. They started out meeting one another and being like, Oh hey, hi. And then like by the end of that, they were definitely gonna go on a date. <laughs> it was cute. Yeah. Christmas dating. Yeah, it was a Christmas miracle. <laughs> Christmas miracle. <laughs> Love it. So that was a fun episode and you did a good job, TM. Well, thank you. Um, one thing I'd like to add, because in one of, the review, one of the reviews for this game, it was that I'd like to see the mechanics use another system. Uh, spoilers, there's an upcoming system in the future made by the same people. That's just the same game with a different coat of paint. And we'll talk about that. That'll be fun. That's, that's a game that you could use. It's not as specific and niche as Christmas, but it's still a very subjective it's you, you'll see once we once i once it gets brought up yeah name but it shout it's it out by it's the, pirates oh, of the bone called, blade yeah it's called oh. horrible henchmen oh that one and too. it's the same oh oh so they Is have it? multiples <laughs> yeah oh that's interesting yeah we can reskin this game infinitely we can so, make infinite <laughs> games <laughs> <laughs> and people will play them. <laughs> but the but the cool thing is, because I already got a sneak peek in Horrible Henchman. I'd have to look at their other games. But they have this, it's the same layout. And they have um, that improv, if, that imp, imp, improvisational events picture table on the bottom of each of their things. And it's always just, there's no explanation. It's just a little picture. And you have to interpret what it means when you roll the dice and come up with that. So it's really fun. They have that for Horrible Henchman too. They've got their own cute little pictures for that. The games are use the same mechanics, but they have different random roll tables for different example events. But you can make up whatever you feel like. But they're really useful and they're nice little yeah you know, two page, uh two page game systems that look nice or fun to look at. The horrible henchman has a really really fun uh what were you, hunchback character uh. Or uh, what would you call it? Well, Nuch, what is the one NPC you created that's like uh, Professor Sparks' uh, henchman? What's that character? <laughs> I can't think of what you call that character, but there's a there's a picture of that kind of character <laughs> on Horrible Henchman. It's perfect. Minion. Minion. Yeah. Oh, yeah that's works. not his name, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Nightshade Lobo is his name. Yeah, that's him. Yep. But there's a very nightshade Lobo looking character <laughs> on the nice. cover of Horrible Henchman. It's 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 really it's really funny, really cute. It's yeah, it's it's like the less evil version of what Guvo's player is worried about, the reskidding and infinite money grabbing. It's like the one page free version of that where nobody's really getting rich. <laughs> no one off cares. It. Yeah. No. <laughs> it's like, who cares? Reskin. It's just I mean, cute. Yeah. That that yeah. reskinning, I mean, you can you, you can find a dozen, you know, laser dozen feelings hacks and yeah. you know, yeah. everyone like anytime More somebody hacks. yeah, anytime somebody yeah. and um mm. uh Honey Heist just got just got that treatment as well. So there's like a no. lot of yeah, uh, Grant put Honey Heist out as um, a- available for that, so like people are now oh, doing wow. that, which is kind of cool. And you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, there's a lot of games that are Creative Commons licensed like that that are getting good hacks like that. So it's kind of fun. I would love to see a hack of Honey Heist and what you would do with it because there's there's not there's not a lot to work with. You'd have to add a lot to really make it your own. I think. There is exactly one page to work with. We hacked it. We made it even simpler. <laughs> one die and that's it. Forever. So I, I, yeah, I know somebody who hacked it. Well, I, not, I don't know them personally, but um, somebody hacked it to do Cocaine Bear. Um, which I was, uh, very, nice. very, yeah. I was very yeah. interested in because of the Cocaine Bear zine of Cocaine Bear games. That, that, um, yeah. But yeah, there's. But you I need do that it. in my life. <laughs> yeah well we, yeah we could talk <laughs> um yeah so there's some there's some fun things you can do with with anything i mean any 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 heist story you want to tell you could tell with honey heist you know you just exactly, you don't yeah. you don't have to have them be bare you know it could be something well, else yeah i think it takes away from that though because you know you the whole you know, obviously you are a bear and you wear a hat. It's like, and that's the only way you can blend into society. And I think that's such a, 
lovely little touch to something that means nothing. But if you role play it properly and you actually wear hats as groups, it makes it even funnier. Like, yeah, I love that part of it. Oh, yeah. I mean, mm. like the original Honey, Honey Heist is fantastic that way. It's just it's yeah. like if you're hacking, you're trying to make that game, but in a different like with a different feel so like you could make mm. it a oceans 11 and instead of hats there's something else you know maybe it's your role in the in the crew or something else like that so yeah does anybody know uh, the black hack mm. so that I, so the black hat is like a sorry sorry wait you can say oh i was gonna say i'm familiar but i haven't actually played mm. it so that is a hack of a d6 system and i know someone who made a hack of that game <laughs> It's like, yep. so, the, so I'm just like, and I, I helped do the graphic design for it. And I was just like, how can you hack a hack, hack. game that is already <laughs> simple enough? Uh-huh. <laughs> what do you, what are you doing with this? But he did it and uh, he was happy with it. So that's funny. There's a certain point where it just comes full circle, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to hack that game. Yeah. And yeah. it goes back to be more complicated yeah, forever. <laughs> I kind of love that we went from talking about Christmas capers, which is like a one page yeah, like guided D6 rolling game to a Grant Howitt discussion because the next mm. one that we're going to discuss is a Grant Howitt game, hooray. you guys. Uh, I don't no, think they know hooray. that. They didn't let's know that. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, so oh. the episode The Eyes Have It featured the RPG system The Witch is Dead. Before I read the review that I wrote, I'm going to say, let me talk about Grant Howitt for a second. People talk about powered by the apocalypse as being not mechanically interesting they do the move system you roll 2d6 you add between negative one and positive two to at the end maybe you hold a plus one going forward you know blah blah grant how it makes an actual different mechanic for every one page rpg that he releases and um i don't know if he's gonna listen to this or not so i won't gush about him too much because it's awkward when you gush about someone and then they like are real (laughs) it's easier to fangirl about imaginary people (laughs) but i respect that the mechanics are always interesting in grant howitt games and i will continue to suggest grant howitt one page rpgs to my group because each one has a unique and interesting mechanic behind it it's not just one page of a cute like these words go together like sad vampire boyfriend, which I desperately want to play, or reverse Beastmaster, where the beasts control you and you must listen to every command that they give you. <laughs> like It's not just a cute thing, you know, like honey heist, you are a bear and you must steal. It's also an interesting mechanic. So the witch is dead. Now I'll talk about the mechanics of the witch is dead in particular. The witch is dead is a one page role playing game. And I'll add from Grant Howitt, who we all know and love. It comes with 10 example animals and their numerical stats in four skills, clever, fierce, sly, and quick. Players also choose one spell. When you try to do something, you roll a d10 and you add your stat to your roll to see if you succeed. And those stats vary from zero to three. So it's kind of like Grant Howitt's Powered by the Apocalypse game, which is interesting. Um, When you roll equal to or under your danger tally, the game suggests both character death and some alternatives, such as being trapped or captured, which is nice. The premise of the game is that a witch who all the animals loved has been murdered, and if you catch the murderer within 24 hours, you can magically bring the witch back to life. It's a mystery-solving game, like all your favorite mystery TV shows and movies. Oh, I had so much fun playing The Witch is Dead. If you're a fan of murder mystery and you want a framework for getting to be the detective who investigates the dead body, try The Witch is Dead. I liked it. And special shout out to our GM from that episode who wrote some supplementary material. The GM wrote a list of like two pages of spells and the material ingredients for those spells. So we were like, I, we gotta do this spell, guys. Gotta get these material components. We need essence of nightshade. And then somebody (laughs) was like, nightshades. Essence of Nightshades. Is there an Italian restaurant nearby? Because we can get some pizza sauce. And it devolved into us with our little horse hooves mixing pizza sauce together with other spell ingredients in takeout styrofoam containers, trying to pop the eyes out of this like horrible witch hunter dude who had killed our friend. And it was fun. We put the, the sauce spell in the sprinkler system and we got those eyes. And it was like, <laughs> it was a good time. <laughs> I'm going to have to listen to that episode now. It was Same. my favorite episode of 2023, and you can't wow. stop me. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so 
I'm just going to put this out there because I know that we have a very busy calendar for games that are coming up. What if spinoff podcast of just one pagers or even just one pagers by Grant Howitt? Just saying. I agree. I would get sick of anything I love if too much of it was presented to me. Well, okay. There's a lot of one pages yeah. out there. Yeah. But I do like one pagers like two out of every four weeks. You know. It really depends on the group. It really depends on the role play. It really depends on the story. Like all we're talking about is mechanics. And if the mechanics fit the story, then it shouldn't matter what we're playing. And that's why when we get on to New Edo, <laughs> I will there. be crying <laughs> about how terrible I hated it. Oh, I would wow. I'd like to describe one page games as each of them can be little bitty pieces of candy, all different flavors with different mm -hmm. textures and they're really nice and sweet but they're all sort of the same because they're just little small samples and then you get new edo and new edo is just a giant wedding cake with all the bells and whistles but and you're eating it and you're like oh god it's so sickly <laughs> new new Was... edo well we'll talk about new edo when we get to new edo right <laughs> okay <laughs> Not not really a good game for a one shot to test, but it has the potential. I I really love New Edo. I liked it as one shot. Personal, so yeah. anyway, but let's talk about Adventure Dice because then the one after that is Lerps, and we're talking like you guys want to get into Crunch. Oh, I will talk about Lerps for like half an hour. Be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, can I, just, can I just give a quick Sorry. shout out on The Witch is Dead though? Uh, yes. because this is one that I haven't listened to the episode yet. I haven't played this game, but it has been on my to-do to list for a long time uh, because I love one-page games and I love investigative mystery games. So this is like the sweet spot and I am, I am looking forward to running it sometime. Our GM from that episode can send you the spell book that he created he is an incredibly clever and intelligent person and each of those spells so he's he gave us this list of like causes of death and like <laughs> each of the spells only worked for one cause of death like this one will bring her back if she got burned to death this one will bring her back if she fell Ooh. from a high cliff and so we had to like investigate how she died so we were like is there a stab wound in the body and <laughs> it was just fun that's so, great yeah listen to that and then yeah let's get that GM in maybe as a player this time isn't it fun that we rotate GMing because then you get to be a player yes. on a game that you love yeah so yes oh I'm down for it I'm sign me up I love the witch is dead we'll do it again hundred percent can Sweet. I start by question asking is lerps gerps no no not okay, related cool. that's fine unfortunate acronym it's choice just... worst part of the game is the name <laughs> yep <laughs> <laughs> I was like just is it like a different uh, another I, hack it's a hack of GURPS no it's, it's not cool it's right. called <laughs> Lewis's unified role playing system and I was like Lewis I don't know who you are but you need to pick a different name we'll get there let's talk about adventure it should be dice Gerald's first. unified role playing system and that'd just be like fine Lewis's <laughs> best system LBS you know or just like something anyway so talk about adventure dice <laughs> okay <laughs> The episode Love Scattered featured the RPG system Adventure Dice. This game lends itself well as a teaching tool for very young players and gives them something to craft as well as helpful rules that encourage role playing. The dice faces make it easier to understand when something good or bad happens, though it gets a bit tricky when you get a smile, check, and X. It's hard to remember what each symbol means in the heat of the moment, and we usually just improvise whatever feels right. Honestly, it's perfect as a teaching tool with little rules to worry about. Mm -hmm. I was a player in that episode and it was the reading what the results of what a role meant. There's a way like a smile meant you learn something or something positive is revealed and a circle or a check is something good happens and acts or something bad happens. A frowny face is you learn something that's negative, but when you're in the heat of role playing and you're trying to improv, you see smile X and check, uh, a smile and check beats an X. So something good happens. That's usually the result. I listened to this episode and I will say that like, it gets my award for the most ignored rule system of this quarter. <laughs> It did not matter what people rolled. If they saw a check, they were going to argue for that check. They were going to be like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah, sure, I got an X. 
and a frowny face. But one of them's a check, so I should succeed in this thing I have attempted. And it's almost like by the end of the episode, they had set down the rules paper and were just straight role playing with one another. Mm -hmm. It was sad. Adventure Mm -hmm. Dice is a fail. I'm sorry. Poor Adventure Dice. It has a nice thing where you can (laughs) cut where you can cut out the dice and craft things and then roll the unbalanced dice. Yeah, if you cut the like dice said, out, you're it's, basically it's making good... a different game. <laughs> it's just no, an no, adventure. It's a, paper. it's a paper that comes with like a sketch on it that you're supposed to cut out and tape into a dice, like a six-sided oh, wow. dice. And you could... So we were talking about this before the game and we were like, but that's not going to roll properly. <laughs> that's going <laughs> to always why, roll That's the why same I say side. this is more of a game for that is meant for younger children and laying them because it's even like smiley face brownie face bag of gold check x it's and it's you cut out dice any ttrpg player knows that dice need to be balanced and this looks like something you would do in like you would make it in elementary school and it's like that's it that's who this is for this is for little kids it's it, it works as on its own but after a while it's just we're ignoring the ru- the rules and the rules yeah. And we're just going with what we could. And this is by Grant Howitt. It's genuinely different than all the other one-page Grant Howitt games. And I applaud him for exploring new avenues. And what we ended up doing, mm-hmm. I wasn't technically a player in this game, but I was part of the planning of it, is that um, people assigned one, two, three, four, five, six to the dice faces and just rolled their normal dice. Because uh, mm-hmm. it seemed like a lot of trouble to cut out and like tape on the mm. Because the we're pieces. boring adults. <laughs> I hate crafting. It sounds Maybe if they had only rolled one dice instead of multiple, it would have been easier to interpret. It sounds a little bit mm-hmm. like some of the criticism of this is similar to the criticism of like Candyland, which is an absolutely terrible game if you were over the age of about five, but is an absolutely <laughs> perfect game when you're two or three years old. Uh, so, so you know, and and um, you know, the smile, the check, the X, uh, like. As adults, if you're trying to cross-reference with numbers, that makes sense. Um, and it seems like a perfect implementation for something that would maybe go into a VTT where it's like, hey, I just, like, I can I can make the faces of the dice return a result that isn't the same as as the number. It can return, like, a, a, a word or a phrase. It mm. might be worth one of those types of games where you buy blank dice and draw on them. Yeah. For kids, like you said, it's great for kids. They can do the drawing, and then they, they feel like they've they're a part of the system, and they've like they're making their own dice, and you can do it how you want. You can do red faces or green faces or whatever. And so, the annual Fight Club episode, "No Rules Just Right," and season twenty twenty three finale episode of "The Fire Inside" both feature the RPG system LERPS, which is short for Lewis's Unified Role Playing System. I love many D6 systems. The dice spill over uh, my hands before I roll a skill check, the better. LERPS has a lot of rules that are probably fun to learn when playing only LERPS, but in the far of playing different systems all the time, it gets hard trying to remember everything. I agree. Lots of dice rolling is fun. That's a good thing to note. You get to roll lots of dice in the system. You get to shake a handful of seven D6s and put it on the table and be like, oh, wow. That is fun. Okay, I'm going to read my review now, and I will claim this review as my own because I am about to be very passionate. All right. <clears throat> LERPS is a free, 100-ish page role-playing game combat system. Players use character points to buy hit points, mana, skills, combat proficiency, and magical spells. The number in your skill is the number of six-sided dice you roll. So like if you have a, a skill of five in archery, you roll five dice. And every dice you get that's a 4, a 5, or a 6 is a success. Skills have fun descriptions of what you can accomplish with them depending on if you rolled 1, 2, 3, or 4 successes. Spells are all basic cast at level 1 unless you want to make them affect more enemies or last longer by trying to cast them at higher level, which means needing more successes. Fail to get one more success than the level you cast the spell at, and you'll have to roll on the miscast table. But the miscast table is super fun. There are a wide variety of monsters in the bestiary and free supplemental extra spells and enemy stats and whatnot. So just the depth of the system, the 
intensity of the miscast table, the spells list, the bestiary. It's super fun. LERPs is my current favorite crunchy role-playing game. And because I'm biased in how much I love it, I will now be very honest and transparent and list the four things that I did not like. One, resistance rolls and criticals are not consistent, and consistency with thresholds would be easier to remember than trying to remember different thresholds. For example, trap resistance rolls are meet it to beat it, but spell resistance rolls are exceed it to beat it. That's no good. Mm. If they were both meet it to beat it or exceed it to beat it, that would be easier to remember. And with criticals, critical successes are when you roll more sixes than your target number, but critical failures are totally different. They don't have to do with your number of sixes. It's when you roll half or more of your dice as ones. So it would be easier to remember if criticals were linked to half your dice or to your target number, but not to both things, depending on the type of critical. So that's that first thing that I don't like about LERPs, internal inconsistency with trap and critical thresholds. The second thing about LERPs that could be better is that there aren't any modifiers applied to resist status effects, traps, and spells. So I'm a Dungeons & Dragons player. I played Dungeons & Dragons for years. And in D&D, your character's agility and the resulting dexterity modifier are what contributes to your ability to dodge traps. You're really agile. You dodge traps better. In LERPs, everybody rolls the same. An out-of-shape person, an Olympic athlete, eh, same ability to dodge a trap. That's not great. And the third LERPS mechanic I'd like to point out is that SPE bonuses to movement are measured in feet. But distance is not measured in feet. Distance is measured in quantum, which are distinct bands, which is a very important theory in physics. Banding for distance is really cool, and I like it. But to interact with the distance system, the bonus to movement granted by spending one SPE shouldn't be plus five feet because the unit of measurement of feet doesn't exist in the distance section of the rule book. Distances <coughs> are quantum bands, medium, long. The SPE movement bonus table should be in the same unit of measurement as the distance. Instead of plus five feet, it should say plus one distance band. And I feel like that's something that you could change really easily. So now that I've said that, I'm going to move on. The very last thing, my fourth and last topic to discuss about the mechanics that is my biggest issue with LERPs, I save the worst for last, is that the wording that describes how magic works is self-contradictory. On one page, you're reading about how flexible the magic system is, and there's this table for how much damage is dealt per casting level, right? This almost caused a fight between me and another person. (laughs) Person, (laughs) I'm sorry. It almost did. Because, so like, there's a table, and it's like... Level 3, I cast this much damage. Level 5, I cast this much damage. But on another page, you read that that spell school can't deal damage. It's completely unable to deal damage. And only this list of specific schools of magic can deal damage to enemies. Illusion can never deal damage to an enemy. Fire can. I, I ran LERPs as a GM three times in 2023 and has confused every person I've asked to play LERPs with me. I suggest clarifying the damage per level table to add the caveat right there on the table that it's only for this specific list of spell schools. So everybody sees that and knows that you're only able to do damage with this specific spell school and that there's entire schools of spells that you can't do damage, which which is cool because support classes are more supported by LERPs than any other system I've ever played, Dungeons and Dragons even. This is a better bard than in D&D. In in D&D, bards do as much damage as, let's face it, like fighters really. I mean, you get a high-level bard, and you get some of those high-level bard spells, they're like powerhouses. In LERPs, they'll never directly affect combat. They don't, like, hurt the enemy, but you do such cool and awesome and amazing spells that it is so worth it to be one of these support classes in LERPs. You can, like, for example, it changed the damage output of the enemy to one-sixth of its previous number. Okay, (laughs) technically, I didn't hurt the enemy. You're fine. (laughs) But you're not. (laughs) It's so much cooler. The support classes in LERPs are really worth playing. So, like, just say that they don't deal damage right out front. Anyway, I've I've looked up and I've stopped reading. I'm going to go back to reading. Um, Those are the four minor issues I have with the LERPs rulebook. Just explicitly say this class doesn't do damage, and that's awesome. We do other stuff instead that is much, much worth it. Okay, so the reason why I bother to get that nitpicky and take 15 minutes of your time on this LERP system is that because this Lewis's Unified Role-Playing System currently holds the title of my favorite non-D&D crunchy role-playing rule set that I've ever played. The spells list are phenomenal. The miscast table is a delight. 
I love it. <laughs> it's really fun. It's like your hand blows off. It's really fun. The point by system lets you build exactly the character you had imagined. The support classes and lerps can strongly impact battle without damaging the enemy, technically. It's like I'm not hitting you, but like even more effective. <laughs> the character builds all play very differently than one another. I'm going to stop listing things I like about lerps and will just say it was very fun to play and I hope you give Lewis's unified role playing system a play too and I, I really hope he changes the name. <laughs> <laughs> That's my review. Uh, the episode Sab the Crab featured the RPG system Desperado Quick Draw Edition. Outside of combat, the system is very similar to Savage Worlds, with the size of the die you use increasing instead of just stat points or anything like that. Once you get into combat, though, it just kind of falls apart. Actions are only one second long, so it can take at a minimum of four turns before you can attack, which just leads to a lot of sitting around and waiting to actually do anything. Even then, it's possible to be interrupted, rendering all that time you spent trying to build up your attack just completely worthless. Uh, another thing is that a lot of things aren't like completely explained in the book, so you have to kind of guess and wing it and see uh, what it was. Like For instance, physical defense is described as a thing that you actually have, uh, but the book doesn't really tell you what that is. So... Uh, I would definitely make it make some improvements with that, like just kind of filling out like what your stats are and what your actual things are. So that way you're not having to just kind of wing it or look at random parts of the book uh, and just making the optional speed up combat rolls uh, your normal, the normal combat, because combat in that game was terrible. <laughs> mm. So this is this is my review. Guvo. I never introduced myself. Earlier on, I was like, here's so-and-so and here's so-and-so. I'm me, Guvo. Desperado Quickdraw attempts to blend some 3.5 mechanics with a gunslinging Western theme, featuring detailed gun mechanics that overshadow the overall setting. The game leans heavily towards what felt like war game elements rather than traditional RPG aspects. In the system, every action is condensed into a one-second time frame, as Zidane said, and players might endure up to 10 actions or turns just to execute a single shot. Draw, load, cock, aim, and fire are the five slowest words I've ever experienced in a game before. <laughs> <laughs> the intention to emphasize realism is clear, but the challenge lies in keeping players engaged during the prolonged waiting periods before significant actions occur. Moreover, half uh, range restrictions heavily penalize shots be between, sorry, beyond 50 to 100 feet forcing players to stay close to their start targets, which would be a better fit for the system. Small scale scenarios like bar fights or in narrow streets, uh, close combat and melee actions, sorry, close combat or melee actions confined to stand are confined to standing right next to the target, which makes sense thematically, but clash with the system's limited movement allowance of four yards per turn. Uh, while not frequently encountered, the interrupting actions mechanic feels unbalanced, especially when NPCs can exploit numerous free actions without even uh, consuming a turn. This can lead to frustrating outcomes such as missed shots or after waiting 10 turns just for an opportunity to take anything meaningful. While the concept of Desperado Quick Draw could offer an enjoyable experience under strict conditions, a slow pace and potential anticlimactic anti outcomes may deter players. Uh, this game needs humans facing humans in a very small town setting where this, the system's limitations could contribute to an intriguing experience despite its flaws exploring the game under these conditions might warrant a second play not a giant crab the size of an island hmm. <laughs> definitely not <laughs> maybe a bit smaller only if the crab was just as slow <laughs> as us but it wasn't it was like lightning but anyway that's oh, fine okay so i should explain like, i crab. <laughs> I created a few different fights, and that was the one you guys went for. So it was like a role playing thing, but I started a bunch of easy fights. A bunch of it's got some NPCs. That was the legendary boss. Mm, <laughs> it felt like it. Go ahead, Bartholomew's player. You were gonna. Say I was something. gonna say, or if you gave the the crab uh, a cowboy hat. <laughs> yeah, that would <laughs> no, make the game it. so much better. Yeah, that, that would have sold it. Yeah. it. Sold it. Yeah, yeah. Done. <laughs> Move on. Like, don't even need to review anymore. Give everyone hats <laughs> like Grant Howitt and we're fine. <laughs> There's a Magic the Gathering um, cracked one that has like hats. And I played a black white deck where it was like, if you have hats, you're un unstoppable. It was really fun. Anyway, so 
Desperado Quick Draw is a 75 page quick start guide to playing Desperado, which is not currently wait, available in which I've. Hmm. It's a quick start. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have oh any magic in Lord. it. Oh, my Lord. I and would have free. wrote something very differently if that was the case. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, this isn't available to the public. And I feel like the creator withdrew it because it's not available anymore. It was available a year ago and then they sent it to us. So some explanation. Fire Breathing Kittens has a really slow turnaround time. We get around to playing your game like a year after you sent it to us. So if you withdrew it in that year, it doesn't really matter to us unless you send us another email saying, hey, we withdrew it. But if you don't tell us, we just play it. So we played this and Desperado Quick Draw is a 75 page quick start guide to playing Desperado. It's not currently available to the public and I appreciate the creator sending us a promotional copy. You can generate your background, stats, and items by drawing cards from a poker deck, and initiative is determined by poker hands. This rulebook could benefit from adding an example combat, a glossary at the end that defines all the terms used, for example physical and mental defense would also be helpful. Desperado Quick Draw is genuinely very different from the majority of TTRPGs, which I like. It was interesting, playing genuinely different mechanics. And I can see why you withdrew it. The slow pace of the combat could be sped up. Spending a dozen turns waiting to attack isn't an experience I'd want to do again. But if you did, like, draw as one action instead of five, you know, if you'd, like, chambering a weapon as one action instead of four, you got, that's the sort of thing you got to play through it and be like, wow, it's an hour into the combat and I haven't fired a shot. You know, that's the sort of thing you got to play through and figure out yourself and get some wide-eyed nods. That's why it needs a very very specific setting it's like if you want to play realistic cowboys and you don't really want to get into fights very often because it's um very dangerous and it's supposed to feel like it's supposed to feel slow and very meticulous that's absolutely fine but that's not how it was presented mm. yes i had a giant evil crab uh, undead revived crab <laughs> but i feel like if it was one action per draw and one action per chambering and one action per it would have been a lot more mm -hmm. yeah it would have been five times as quicker fun. but you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah and segue from that concern because there is well i'll go over with this review the combat for this game takes too long normally though it has an optional method to speed things up and that method is oh every Turn can be three turns, and that would speed things up a bit. They do have, in, in what they wrote down, it's a shame they backed it out. I think it's an all right system. It just has its flaws. But, yeah, they do have the optional, because it, already to them it was a concern. This is going to take too long. So they have the optional rule set of you can speed things up by making three turns equal one turn. So there is the optional rules for that but we played it with the normal rules to see how i was really like it's not a typical adventure ttrpg being better suited for the methodical shootouts that are played in slow motion combat plays out like you're in a bullet time video game you know actively bullet time you're slow in slow motion reacting with every fraction of a second because it really does feel like it's not just every second but it's like uh, seconds within seconds it's very your adrenaline's pumping and time is slowing down, which is interesting and a cool way of doing combat, but it does get very tiring <laughs> when you're try you're lifting up your gun and it's take and it took three turns just to do the, to do that. Yeah, just, just, and then sure. to start loading it with a bullet <laughs> for five more turns. <laughs> and then a tur and then a couple turns to aim. And then finally, hopefully you hit yeah. when you fire. <laughs> and if yeah. you don't, you're like, oh boy. Restart. This is a gr <laughs> this is yeah. a this is a great game for anyone looking to run a short Western campaign with an emphasis on shootouts. I would love to play this where it's super serious and you are um, you know, it's, there's no comedic element of it. There's no um you don't mess around. It's very serious. I think it could, like you said, in bullet time, mm -hmm. be really interesting now to play that. Uh, but you'd need um, very uh, specific players for that. 
um, obviously not on this show, but just as in my own free time, I'd be like, that'd be really cool. Do you know what I mean? Like a really mm -hmm. dark and serious, um, realistic shootout game, like Cowboys. That'd be really cool. Western. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's something I agree with too. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I get, I mean, obviously we were flavoring it worked well enough for what we, what we did with it, but yeah, it definitely. Like, I think once you take, it's a system that if you take it outside of its intended element, it kind of falls apart a, a little bit. <laughs> Not much. I mean, when we were just playing like normally, it was great. Uh, like the skill rolls and stuff were fine. It was literally just it's the combat was the part where it just kind of fell apart uh, for me personally. That's just me stating how I felt about the, the combat. aspect. everything else, like I said, was fantastic. Like everything else, like we were uh, playing off each other and everything else. Guva going off into the jungle to go eat bugs because he was losing mm -hmm. his mind for oh, no real reason hungry. actually. But I was very hungry. <laughs> I need to eat all times. Um, but yeah, this like there's everything else about it was fine. Like I like the because Savage Worlds is my second favorite kind of TTRPG style of system. So just with how the the stat leveling up feels a little bit more organic than something like a D and D where you're just putting points in to things or you're just leveling up and bam you suddenly know how to cast fireball for no real reason uh i do i do like that or more organic style of 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 characterization or how you level up your characters basically uh, but I, I i enjoyed the system like i said outside of combat so i'm just rambling i'm just saying the exact same thing like over and over <laughs> and over again I'm <laughs> but it, it's, it's, okay. it's important we've got handoffs and the next yeah. handoff is to guvo wait i've got one more thing to say <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um oh damn. What did he just what were you just saying, Zidane? Um it, that everything else about oh, it was fine yeah, except right. the combat. It, yeah, it's if the designer is listening, either make a really serious, slow paced um cowboy game or do more with the poker hands because as soon as the cards came into it, I was like, Oh, this will be cool, but you only use it to to build your character and do an uh, initiative so that those two mechanics don't feel intuitive with each other one feels quite interesting and quite thematic in a generic western game and the other one feels like we're playing a serious slow war game so pick one and do something with it because i think both of them could be interesting in their own um, regard yeah if i'm taking eight turns off i'd better be playing a poker hand during that like drawing a card every turn that you don't get to fire? Just doing something with it, like doing more with it. Like poker hands and cards are really fun when you've got um, a generic Western that can be funny. It could be Wild Wild West or it could be, you know, like Young Guns. But no one wants to play Wild Wild West by waiting 10 turns to load their weapon. It's that they, they, they don't <laughs> fit together. So pick one. I, I I would play No Country for Old Men style of Western TTRPG. Yeah, like that, that'd be cool. That, 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 that seems like you need, but you no, you couldn't do that in this system. But would you bet on a coin toss? <laughs> 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 All right, let's talk about dicing with death. Uh, the companion episodes, you only live twice and dead ringers, featured the RPG system dicing with death. First review is an excellent rules light RPG that gets you playing quick and emphasizes role playing. Looking forward to playing at a higher level so we have access to more traits. Mm -hmm. Using traits as a central dice rolling mechanic makes for a great makes for great role play moments since you can just focus on bolstering your role through whatever makes your character through whatever makes your character you, or risk doing something out of your character's comfort zone for a chance to earn a new trait. The luck roll mechanic is always fun to implement in situations when a player expects something wild to happen, like materializing a MacGuffin out of thin air. Even after failing a luck roll, it adds loads of charm to the story. My only issue is the lack of mechanics surrounding initiative. Everyone had the same initiative in a fight I was in, and while the item creation mechanic has potential, linking initiative to what item you're holding seems a bit out of place, a bonus or penalty would work en work enough. Perhaps make the initiative a d6 roll. Players go first. Ties can be discussed among players, which worked which which worked out in our game that I played. Overall, this game has a great concept that's easy to understand. 
though it needs some fine-tuning. I listened to both games, and it was... There was a combat in the other game that was a little bit more combat-y, if that makes sense. When you have a larger number, like a d12 versus a d6, you have less overlap of numbers. Like, rolling a d20, you can expect fewer overlap rolls than rolling a d4. So a solution for that for... I know the creator's not going to listen to this, but um, just in case they are, would be to have those numbers randomized across a larger spectrum so that there's more difference between the individual players. Like, oh, I have a two and oh, I have a three across a d20, you know, versus we both have twos on a d6. Are we ready for the third review of this? Yeah. Dicing with Death is a fun system with a great spin on the GM player interaction. Most TTRPGs have the GM as the absolute rule giver, but in this game, the players can actively bargain with the GM to determine the potential consequences of their roles. It's an interesting form of gambling to get as many dice as possible to increase your chances of success on a roll while also acknowledging the risks you take to even the odds. The player can't roll until the terms of the roll's outcome are agreed upon by the player and GM, which encourages fair play and dialogue between both parties. I'm definitely going to keep an eye on this game and run it in the future. Yeah, Dicing with Death is going to be run twice in the upcoming quarter. So you'll see that one again. Mm -hmm. Real easy to pick up and play. And I do like the trait system. Like it's, it's that system where in most RPGs you're thinking, okay, what do I roll for this? I want to use the big trait that I dumped all my points into, like dexterity. So I want this to be a dex check. Even though it's obviously a strength check or or a charisma check, it's like, I'm going to try to get the Traits are a way of doing that, but it's a way you can role play with it. And I, there was another system we had, Rhesus, that implemented something like that, where you don't have stats, you have, I don't know if they were called traits, but they were certain things. You made, you made your own traits. Perks. It sounds, perks, right. And you use those. And I remember problems in that system because I was having a hard time figuring out how to, well, what's a dex roll? No, it's not a dex. You, you take whatever the things you wrote and you explain how that is what you, so I took the experience from that game into this game and it's, it reminds me a lot of that game. Yeah, it is kind of like that because mm -hmm. you have three things, so you must argue for how one of these three things applies. Yeah. I think that game will probably continue to evolve because that is a pre-release system and our actual play is going to factor into the design of the game. All right, let's go to the next one. All right. Yeah, let's go ahead and keep this party trainer rolling here. Yeah. The <laughs> Wait, last one, not just yeah. next one, last oh, one. Yes, with great <laughs> finality. Uh, the companion episodes There Can Be Only One and Rolls Off the Tongue featured the RPG system New Edo. The rules and character creation are in-depth and complex. My biggest negative is the defense values of NPCs and the amount of skills viability investment need a better balance. Range combat is much easier, and I don't know if this was a design choice or accidental, but it honestly almost discourages melee combat. And that doesn't always feel fair. My feedback is next, but I feel kind of bad. But then I feel angry again, and then I feel okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, don't worry. Don't, don't they... worry about it. They need it. Hmm? I said, don't worry about it. They need it. I know I know there are some things wrong with New Edo, but I still love the game. Creator, Chico's player genuinely loves your game, and I want you that to soften it. the blow of what I'm about to say. All right. <laughs> <laughs> The new Edo rulebook has 300 pages of paragraphs that for me were made more difficult to read by the organization of its ideas. It would improve this rulebook to cluster information on the same topic together. For example, pages 58 and 59 talk about the priority by system. Right after that, pages 60 and 61 are a blank character sheet. And then right after that, page 62 goes right back to talking about that priority by system from pages 58 and 59. The character sheet in the middle could be elsewhere to not interrupt the priority by section that it interrupted. Like it could be with the explanation of what numbers to add together on the character sheet, but that's on page 206, 150 pages away. Good luck finding that. Here's a second example. <laughs> the fact <laughs> that you can spend leftover og noise to buy skills is on page 65. 
not in the main section that lists augs from pages 176 to 189, nor on the aug noise calculation table on page 71. Why is that in three different sections? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those three things could be clustered together. Here's a last example. <laughs> Each one of these examples caused me a day of confusion. Okay, last example on the description of the tactic skill is on page 202. But you can't just use that description on page 202. You read the tactics. It says tactics, the skill, and it describes it. And if you read that, you're fucked because you have to keep reading. You also need to read <laughs> the tactics section on page 229. To learn, that's 27 pages later because it describes how you use that tactic skill and it completely eliminates the way I tried to use that tactic skill. <laughs> These could be together in one location. Organization issues represent a huge hurdle to new players creating a character and playing new Edo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm into that. Those yeah. are those are valid quizzes and I do agree with them. So I did. I also played new Edo. This is my first game with the with the fire breathing kittens. <laughs> okay, before you keep going, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. New Edo was a tough one to get into. I'll start with the things I liked about the system. The priority system was an interesting way to indicate what you care about as a player. And I would be very interested in seeing that applied in a different system or in a different, more elegant way. Something that doesn't use subsystems for each priority type. The rulebook is a bit dense, mainly because its organization leaves a lot to be desired. During character creation, it was never entirely clear how many dice or bonuses I was supposed to put on my sheet, and the priority system seemed clunky to me. It essentially set up, as I said, multiple subsystems for generating the dice used in a challenge. Also, terminology. Tier, rank, point, levels... These all generally mean similar things in English, and it was really confusing which one was meant in which situation. The combat rules seemed needlessly complex as well. When designing a game, if you want it to feel fast-paced, less is definitely more. And Desperado could take a, a, a hint here, too. <laughs> <laughs> any any game that has a rule that says if your foot is visible you don't have full cover is just asking for table arguments personally i'm a fan of systems that instead offer something in exchange for taking a negative like that something that rewards interesting story play for more than anything else once at the table and i do think this was a testament to the gm the combat was less in the way than i expected part of that is because we didn't really get into fights I think at one point I said, I am afraid of this combat system. But also at the table, it became clear that the combat system was a dice pool with varying dice size of type of mechanic. All of the design choices that led to that seemed overly complicated. But in the end, it boiled down to you get this many D10s, this many other dice size because of your skills. In general, I would probably not play New Edo again because it's not my cup of tea. However, if a friend were asking for a system that does that kind of Asian-inspired cyberpunk magic-infused setting, and they really enjoyed fiddling with subsystems in a game, and I do have friends who love that, I would recommend it to them as an interesting alternative to the many cyberpunk systems that are currently out there. Yeah, I agree. Those people who enjoy subsystems were thumbing up during her speech. You couldn't see that as a listener, but there was some happy <laughs> thumbs up. They were like, yes, subsystems. <laughs> <laughs> now, the last review of this episode is from me. So New Edo boasts an impressive presentation, flexible character creation system, and a unique gambling element known as the fate card. However, I was surprised by the significant time investment required for character creation, which seemed more substantial than the game mechanics themselves. The core system relies on a straightforward XD10 plus skill, D -roll, no, basically dice roll. While the simplicity has its merits, I didn't delve into the magic system and found the hours spent reading and planning my character resulted in less engaging rolling mechanics. The ranking system adds a nice touch, but at rank one, you might feel ill-equipped to face opponents beyond your rank. Uh, potential simplicity measure. Uh... The world is well crafted and the book's writing is commendable. Uh, despite a lack of imagery, the graphic design effectively conveys the world's atmosphere. Although not be beginner friendly, I consider playing it again, perhaps just once more. 
uh, possibly with pre-generated characters to avoid build errors. Um, are the mechanics thematic to some extent, but not enough to fully capture the essence of Neon Samurai World? So yeah, too much, too much, too. I mean, I think I spent half a day trying to make a character, and it. All I was doing was just adding one to somewhere else, a three to another place, a yeah. six to this place, and being like, this took me a day to do this, this number. And it didn't well, even change my gameplay. And I, I want to I wanna say a thank you for, for calling out the fate card in your review, because that is something I forgot to mention that I did really enjoy. And even though it's very good. Yeah. Even though I like in our game, only one person rolled on the fate card and that was me uh, and I didn't hit anything. I I enjoyed it conceptually and it is a mechanic that I would love to see in a different game, but I would uh, love I to see agree. it again. Yeah, I agree. So more focus. So on- I, so I mean, I forgot to write my own review for this but <laughs> just because of the time it came out like i was going through some crazy stuff but uh you're here now so it's yeah good. so yeah. me so for me what was weird was character creation for me was super straightforward i don't know if it's just because i played some really weird systems uh throughout the course of my lifetime but the thing that actually made it really really tedious was like uh sadie's player was saying was the fact that everything's all over the place so, like, if I wanted to find one thing, I had to go to one page. And then, I mean, fortunately, with it being PDF based, like, you can click it and it'll send you to another spot. But there's also a chance the thing you just clicked <laughs> isn't actually the thing you needed. Yeah. It might be something totally <laughs> unrelated to the thing you were wanting. So, I think I forget what it was. It was like a skill I think I was looking for for combat or whatever. And so I clicked it and it took me to something I didn't need. Fortunately, with Firefox, it's good back arrow and it put me back to the regular page. I just control F to my way to victory at that <laughs> point, which was the same thing I did with with Desperado when I was trying to figure out what certain things were. I just control F it. And when I was looking for physical defense, there was one instance of physical defense <laughs> describing that you had it. And that was it. There was nothing else there. Yep. <laughs> it's not a definition. It doesn't tell you what points go into it. <laughs> yeah. Uh... I I feel like glossary, the first thing, if you're creating a game that you should ask yourself, I'm about to publish this game, do I have a glossary? And it not only needs to define the word, but list every page that word appears on. And if that's 50 pages apart every time, think about it. Yeah. I mean, I played... (laughs) Indexing. I've played... (laughs) <laughs> I've played GURPS. Like, I've played GURPS. I have played Revised Edition Vampire the Masquerade. I have read the rule book for 5th Edition Vampire the Masquerade. They all, like, it was like, man, I don't understand what this part means. I can go to the back. It's like, oh, okay, I go to this page. Here's another instance of the word I need. Perfect. Problem solved. Here's what the Haven background is. Here's a definition of it later down the line, just in case I needed it. Yep. But yeah, like with with Nueto, it was just kind of it was just it was discombobulated uh, just because I really like using the word discombobulated. <laughs> and I feel like it is appropriate to describe <laughs> the system, not because it was my favorite spell to play against people when I played Magic the Gathering on paper, uh, hardcore. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it just yeah, Nueto. I mean, I liked playing it. I didn't get to actually do any combat whatsoever. I built a combat heavy character. <laughs> And just by pure happenstance, I didn't do any combat uh, during the system, which is fine. I just want to say here, there's some background you don't know about, which is that the reason why we played New Edo again was because I ran it for the first time as a GM and I didn't do much combat. I did one action for each person in a game. Mm-hmm. And Chico's player, who's sitting right there, said, I wish mm-hmm. I had played that more rounds. And you were the GM. And how many rounds of combat did we do in your game? Zero. Right. All right, I'm just saying. We, now we had the opportunity <laughs> to do combat. We just decided to elicit a gang war instead. <laughs> That's true. Wait, wait, wait. I I did punch uh or hit hit Professor Spark. I don't know if that yes. counts as a round of no, combat, yeah, that. but that was it. Yeah. Mm. So it's a companion episode and Guvo's player is doing a big like me, me, me fingers, 
You guys actually did a con- that's fair. You guys did mm-hmm. a proper new Edo combat. We have finally put new Edo system to rest. We have done a combat in new Edo. Thank you, Guva. Without you fighting yourself to death, we wouldn't have been able to do that. We did so thank all you. the combat. We did dueling and many rounds of this close to death level combat there. <laughs> Yeah, you, That's pretty you intense, f- actually. Thank, thank you. Yeah. You fought your doppel. Thank you for doing that so we never have to play this system again. <laughs> uh, I I will be the naysayer of the crowd. <laughs> I will realistically, I would probably buy the book of this, if not just to add it to my shelf. But my friends and I, we're a bunch of big dorks. Like, I'd probably have fun playing this system with my friends in person. I wouldn't do it mm-hmm. online. Or anything, but I would probably actually have fun playing. Like my friends are just big old, big old. No, nerds. no, it, it is a good system. So, like the creator genuinely is a real human being listening to this, and you have made a good thing. It's just that you've also made a frustrating thing by your lack of indexing, and that's fair for our round one play testing. I'm going to call this players to have a frustration with, and in the future when so we're recording this in 2024. And in the future, when people play Nuetto and it's properly indexed, you're going to have a fantastic time because this is a great system. It's thorough. It's got augs. It's got rotes. That's mechanical augmentation and spell rotes for Kami, the god system. It's a really cool game. And we're expressing our frustration with the glossary system to express that we were invested emotionally in enjoying this because it has really good flavor. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I'd like to add, I didn't write a review, but I'd like to review. I already reviewed it last year because I was a player in the game. And when I first started looking through the book to create a character, I was frustrated. But it was like that good frustration. Like, I've got to learn how to do this and get it just right. And I poured hours into making my character. And I was so proud and so disappointed when I didn't have any combat. It was just the one session. It was just like, well, that's it, huh? <laughs> Man. Uh, well, you did it now. All right, let's wrap up New Edo. <laughs> let's go to people's favorite game and the game you're most excited about that's upcoming. Let me read off the list of favorite games. So we've got Resolute 2E, the superhero system, where you choose your superhero abilities from a list, and you have to roll multiple times to confirm your attacks and defenses. Root Quick Start, which is based on a popular board game IP, but is actually a very well thought out powered by the apocalypse system that encourages role-playing and doesn't have one single broken move, at least not in my playbook. I would have found it. Christmas Capers, a single pager, genuinely Christmas-themed, nobody died, have a good time system, good for kids. Uh, The Witch is Dead, do you want a murder mystery? You got it. Fantastic Grant Howitt system, better than a lot of the other Grant Howitt systems, really one of my favorites. Adventure Dice, one of the worst Grant Howitt systems. We really just ignored it when we played. I'm sorry. It was it just kind of devolved into role play. Lerps, it's good. Desperado Quick Draw Edition, but it's not available for you to play that. Dicing with Death, we will be playing that again in an upcoming game. And New Edo. You guys, what were your favorites? I'd like to go first. I'd label two favorites. Favorite that I played as a session in Fire Breathing Kittens, and I think is a really amazing game, is Kristen's Capers. And like I said, there are multiple other reskins of that same game by the same creator that you can look look through. Just look up Chris and Scapers. You'll find all the info. Start looking up. There's another game coming up this next quarter called Horrible Henchman. Same game, different coat of paint. And of course, my baby, my favorite, the one I recommend to everyone, but everyone's not, not liking because it was, in a, it was in a one-shot setting. But I understand New Edo. I really... I really love my favorite thing about it. it. I wouldn't even say the mechanics. It's the setting and the races, which are lineages and just all the lore. It, it's a something you should really look, look into and, and try out. <laughs> yeah. Guvo's player. Uh, Guvo would like to play new Edo again. And at the two he yeah. has played, he would definitely not play Desperado again, unless <laughs> it was a very under specific circumstances so let's go right. in the window okay mm. no so i only played one of these which is new edo i do yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry i do not have a favorite game from this quarter because the only one i've played so far is new edo and it can't <laughs> i can't put it on a favorite i'm so sorry 
What? <laughs> I'm winning. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you you got excluded. Yeah. Okay. Like and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a negative. It's a non no contest. <laughs> Like well, subtract it. It was like scratched out. <laughs> so, I have only played two systems since I joined Fire Breathing Kittens. One I'm of them is a system a I hate, uh, and probably unlike Google, uh, I would play it in a very specific fistful of dollars situation again. So, Nuetto is the winner. But I also admitted I would buy the book. I would buy. I would spend the money for the hardcover book to have it. Maybe after a vision or two. <laughs> but yeah, I would actually, I would play Nuetto again. Uh, if uh, not just to fight myself, because I didn't. I had a nice conversation with myself, actually, was what wound up happening in, in uh, my version of the game. That that mm-hmm. was really fun, by the way, that part. Like, I, I loved that part. Uh, I will say mm-hmm. I would buy Nuetto for, as a gift for a friend. That's, the, that's, that's what I actually, that's what I actually did. That's the thing, is I, <laughs> for... I wouldn't. I wouldn't get this for myself. I would, I would hopefully never play this game again, but I would buy this yeah, for well, a friend. Watching Bart try to emulate my <laughs> insane speaking style I, well, as Zidane was pretty hilarious. Yes. <laughs> Wait until you hear his version. Oh, doing Google's voice in the other episode was really fun. <laughs> I'm surprised that I was having so much fun doing it. <laughs> Gotta get a heavy breathing. It's just the labored breathing is so much fun. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm about to read a bunch of systems that we're going to play over the next month, two, three months, whatever. Wait, did we get Sadie's uh, favorite from the quarter? Oh, did you need it? Lurks. Oh, okay. Do you okay. need to know? <laughs> it was you had, pretty self As if you hadn't already said it 500 times. Okay. Please let me be a player. Please jam it. <laughs> In the next few months, we'll be playing the following games. Mall Zombies. Sexy Battle Wizards. Everything is going to crab. Fantasy World, Adventurous, Horrible Henchman, which is one of the Pirates of the Bone Blade and Christmas Capers, same creator, Witch Scouts, Alaria, Valor and Company, Ludus, Nightmares into Reality, Pirates of the Bone Blade, Rises, subcategory Rises Epic, and Dicing with Death and Salvage Union. So everybody, of those games, I know you guys might not be familiar with all of them. Um, I don't anticipate that you've read all the rules for all those games. But if you've, if you've heard of any of them, what are you excited about playing in these upcoming quarter? Um, not really excited, but more intrigued by Pirates of the Bone Blade. You said it's another one like Horrible Henchmen and Christmas Capers. I'll have yep. to look at that. But... One pager, similar design, mm-hmm. landscape style. But other than that, uh, everything is going to crab. That sounds amazing. I wonder if the zombie crab will make a reappearance. <laughs> I have put way too much pressure on myself for that game. I realized that <laughs> last time. Low expectations. Come on, let's be real. It's me. Okay. But <laughs> right. everything is going to crab. You're going to turn into a crab or you're going to die. <laughs> I would say, I mean, I'm looking forward to Pirates of the Bone Blade because that's the one I'm running. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah. But I am planning. Yeah, it's very cheeky. Uh, I would say, though, probably if I have time this weekend, I might try read uh, Fantasy World. I might try and join that. So I'm mm-hmm. intrigued by a slightly crunchier system. So I am looking forward to Salvage Union. Uh, I love mechs. So I'm interested to see how this one plays out. You know it's going to be mech crabs. I'm apparently all crabs <laughs> this season. So. I'm, as long as it's, I might as long as it's have to mech. do Salvage Union. <laughs> So I'm definitely looking forward to running Fantasy World, um, and I am super excited about everything is going to crab. Uh, and having participated in this episode now, I am looking forward to Horrible Henchmen. That sounds super fun, and I hope to uh, hope to join that one. Thank you all for GMing. I'm very glad that you're in this group. So thank you for joining us, everyone. We're joined today by, I'm going to go clockwise, Bartholomew's player. Yep, this is another fun episode to laugh and <laughs> critique and defend the best game ever of this quarter, New Edo. But winning <laughs> one but winning by default. <laughs> 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 but no, I I I, I think <laughs> LARPs is like the better game. I think LARPs is on. the better game, but <laughs> Kubo's player. Thank you everyone for listening. Uh, make sure to go on to Reddit and YouTube and let's chat. So get in the community. And hopefully if you're still listening to this, thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Nux player. Uh, 
thanks so much for listening. I uh, really enjoyed doing this. A lovely, lovely r- rules review and roundup. I I enjoy the, I enjoy talking about systems all the time. So this is great. Thanks. Yay, systems and Zidane's player. Yeah, this was very entertaining. I enjoyed a lot of this. I am genuinely surprised how cognizant I stayed through the whole thing. And <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was a good time. This was a very enjoyable, enjoyable experience for me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.